Hello and welcome to this continuing first look exploring session looking at if you know not me you know nobody or the troubles of Queen Elizabeth the first part of a two-part play by Thomas Haywood and uh, it's it's a play we're enjoying a fair amount so far it's uh, it's painting in pictures it's uh, uh, it's building scenes it's uh, doing interesting things with characters and uh, yeah we're halfway through the play and going to complete it today uh reading uh today elizabeth queen elizabeth to be not yet still princess is hello i'm helen good i'm a historian and i'm in hull uh, reading uh, a, a poor man, Spaniard, Winchester, Queen Mary, currently still queen, and mayor is... That would be me, yes. Sarah Blake. <laughs> <laughs> From Germany, uh, here, allegedly. Uh, it's going to be one of those sessions, I, I just feel it. Uh, reading Pantler, uh, Philip, Constable and Chandos is... Hi, my name's Elizabeth Amisu and I'm an author based in Romford. Uh, reading Benningfield today is... Aliki Chapel, actor and translator living in Lancaster in England. Reading Tame, Howard and Gentlewoman is... Lalit, I'm a teacher calling from Calvados. Uh, reading Berwick, uh, Clar uh, Clarentia and Brockett is... Me, Bryony Sparrow, actor in Lincolnshire, supported today by Nicholas Cage. Indeed, <laughs> uh, other Nicholas Cages are available. Uh, reading Cook, Englishman, Gresham, Carew, and Sergeant today is Alan Scott, confused <coughs> in Suffolk. Uh, reading Second Poor Man, a clown, and Sussex today is. Hello, I'm Lynn Freitas. Uh, I, I also teach and I am coming to you from the northwestern United States with my dicey connection. Mm. Fingers crossed, fingers crossed. Uh, reading Gage today is... Rachel, actor on the East Coast. And I'm your host, Robert Crichton. I'll be reading stage directions and briefly leaping to the fray to read one part. Quite specifically, one. Uh, more on that later. We're leaping into the play around about what we're calling scene 10. Scene divisions uh, could be malleable in a few places and uh, some uh, versions play with an act structure. Uh, but uh, we're going with what we're calling scene 10 because we like it that way. Uh, reading uh, in, we leap into uh, adventures with uh, Enter Cook and Pantler. What storm comes next? This has dispersed us quite and shattered us to nothing. Though we be denied the presence of our mistress, yet we will walk aloof and none control us. Here will she cross the river, stand in her eye, that she may take some notice of our neglected duties. Enter three poor men. Come, this way they say the sweet princess comes, let us present her with such tokens of good as we have. They say she's such a virtuous princess that she'll accept a cup of cold water. And I have a nosegay for her grace. Here she comes. Enter Elizabeth, Benningfield, Gage and Tame. And everybody cries. <coughs> Hello, 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 sweet grace. My grace. Sweet grace. What are these? The townsmen of the country gathered here to greet your grace. Hearing you passed this way. Give them this gold and thank them for their loves. What traitor knaves are gathered here to make a tumult? Now the Lord that bless Lord thy bless sweet thy grace. grace. If they persist, I charge you, soldiers, stop their mouths. It shall not need. The poor are loving, but the rich despise. And though you curb their tongues, Spare them their eyes, your love my smart allies not, but prolongs. Pray for me in your hearts, not with your tongues. See, see, my lord, look, I have still them all, not one amongst them, but debates my fall. Alas, sir, hurry, these are honest countrymen, but much rejoice to see the princess well. My lord. My lord, my charge is great. And mine as great as yours. 
bells. Probably deeper in timbre than that. Hark. Hark, my lord, what bells are these? The townsmen of this village, hearing her highness pass this way, salutes her coming with this peal of bells. Traitors and knaves ring bells when the queen's enemy passeth through the town. Go, set the knaves by the heels, make their pates ring noon. I charge thee, Bowick, Barrick. And exit Berwick. Alas, poor men, help them, thou God above. Thus men are forced to suffer for my love. What said my servants, those that stood aloof? They deeply conjured me out of their loves to know how your case goes, which these poor people second. Say to them, Tanquam Ovis. Come, come away. This lingering will benight us. Madam. This night your lodging's at my house. No prisoner are you, madam, for this night. How no prisoner? No, no prisoner. What I intend to do, I'll answer. Madam, will it please you go? Exit Elizabeth, Benningfield and Tame. Now, gentle master usher, what says my lady? This did she bid me say. Tang quam uvis. Farewell, I must away. And exit Gage. Tanquus Ovris? Pray, what's Tanquus Ovris, neighbour? If the priest were here, he'd smell it out straight. Myself have been a scholar, and I understand what Tanquan Ovis means. We sent to know how her grace did fare. She Tanquam Ovis said, even like a sheep, that's for the slaughter led. Tanquam Ovis. That I should live to see Tanquam Ovis. <laughs> I shall ne'er love Tanquam Ovis again for this trick. And they all exit. We'll run straight into scene 11. Enter Benningfield and Berwick, his man. Berwick, is this the chair of state? Aye, sir, this it is. Take it down. Pull off my boots. Come on, sir. Enter clown. Oh, monstrous. What a fancy companion's this to pull off his boots in the chair of state. I'll fit you a pennyworth for it. Well said, Beric. Bull name. Ah, uh, ha ha, sir. Well said. Now it comes. And the clown pulls the chair from under him. God's pity, I think you are down, cry you mercy. What fancy errant knave art thou? How? Not so fancy an errant knave as your worship takes me to be. Villain, thou hast broke my cropper. I'm sorry, tis no worse for your worship. Knave, dost flout me. And exuant as the clown is beaten out, uh, presumably by Benningfield. We again will go to another short scene before we pause. Scene 12, <laughs> enter the Englishman and Spaniard. The wall, the wall. It's blood, Spaniard. You get no wall here, unless you would have your head and the wall knocked together. Signor <laughs> Cavallero d'Anglaterra, I must have the wall. I do protest. Hadst thou not enforced it, I had not regarded it. But since you will needs have the wall, I'll take the pains to thrust you into the kennel. Oh, base cavallero, my sword and poniard, well tried in Toledo, shall give thee the imbracado. Marion, welcome, sir. Come on. And they fight, and he hurts the Spaniard. Hollo, hollo! Thou hast given me the canvisado. Come, sir, will you any more? Senor Cavallaro, look behind thee. The blade of Toledo is drawn against thee. The Englishman looks back and the Spaniard kills him. Enter Philip, Howard, Sussex, Constable and Gresham. Hang that ignoble groom. Had we not beheld thy cowardice, we should have sworn such baseness had not followed us. Oh, Fostro Mandado, Grand Imperator. Pardon him, my lord. 
Are you respectless of our honour, lords, that you would have us bosom cowardice? I do protest. The great Turk's empire shall not redeem thee from a felon's death. What place is this, my lords? Charing Cross, my liege. Then, by this cross, where thou had done this murder, thou shalt be hanged. So, lords, away with him. And exit the Spaniard. Your grace may purchase glory from above and entire love of your people's hearts to make atonement twixt the woeful princess and our dread sovereign, your most virtuous queen. Who are indeed worthy of memory. My lord, she's factious. Rather could I wish she were married to some private gentleman and with her dower conveyed out of the land than here to flay and be a mutineer. So may your highness rate be more secure, for while she lives, wars and commotions, foul insurrections will be set a broach. I think twere not amiss to take her head. This land would be in quiet were she dead. Oh, my lord, you speak not charitably. Nor will we, lords, embrace his heedless counsel. I do protest as I am king of Spain. My utmost power he stretched to make them friends. Come, lords, let's in. My love and wit I'll try. To end this jar, the queen shall not deny. And they exit. Three short scenes doing very different things, but all painting uh, a, a picture uh, uh, of, of what's going on here. Change in fortunes from Elizabeth and interesting shift from some of the people around her. Some are still very against her, but some of them are going, oh, hang on, I see which way the wind's blowing here. Um, you know, maybe maybe we should be nice to Elizabeth because that would be maybe not make her a prisoner, uh, along with interesting comedy relief um, to do with uh, some poor people um, talking about a, a, a bit of Latin. Um of which I I don't actually know what it means, so I'm 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 with the poor people. Um, uh, anyone actually know what that meant? I I I I, I actually I'm slightly lost on that one. Uh, uh, Ovis is certainly sheep, so yeah, it it's probably is kosher. Hmm. Uh, I I think the cook was right. Yes, I do too. Tanquam is one of those weird words that means something like even as. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. right. As, I mean, she glosses it as as a sheep to the slaughter, but it could be. But we like sheep have gone astray. Mm. Uh, yeah. Uh, thoughts anyway about this? These scenes? Any of those scenes which uh, leap in with thoughts? Because uh, I say we've we've had that that scene with Elizabeth. We have the s slightly random. Uh, WTF scene with uh, Benningfield and Merrick and the clown, um, <laughs> which which I don't know why that's there. Um, uh, and then a slightly more interesting scene with the Spaniard and the Englishman about you know Anglo-Spanish tensions with Philip and and Philip's place in that complexity and and awkwardness of of uh, who gives way to who. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot going on there. I'll go to Aliki, then Lynn, then Helen. Um. I think it's there because slapstick is fun and because you just made fun of the poor people for being ignorant. So let's put a lord down on his ass, making an ass of himself. Yeah, fair enough. Lynn. Um, Helen was saying something la yesterday uh, uh, about how interesting it is that even though um, the person who wrote this was probably very much on the Protestant side of this, the, the conflict that underlies this, that he was careful to make give Mary some agency and, and quite a bit of, of dignity and, and intelligence. And, and again, we're, we're taking a moment to portray Philip as impartial. He's not going to favor a, um, a, a violent Lord just because he's Spanish. He's going to try to make peace between his wife and her half sister. So even though Philip is Spanish and he's Catholic and, and so he's kind of on the wrong side from a certain point of view. The the play is taking a moment to portray him as, as sort of just and decent, which I think is really interesting. Mm. 
Uh, and yeah, because he's in an awkward political situation that, you know, his presence is, is causing problems, but also Elizabeth's presence is, uh, you know, uh, creating tensions as well. And, and there, there's this, this is an interesting power fluctuations going on in this play that, yeah, uh, yeah doing nice things. Ella, Helen. Yeah, if this play is written in 1604, then we're in the middle of the big peace negotiations, ending the war oh. between Spain and England. And the Spaniards are our new best friends. Oh. Also, brand new best friends. Also, I think it's very interesting that none of all of the people who are being swayed to Elizabeth are partly because they feel sorry for her and partly because she is a daughter, in theory illegitimate at this time, but a daughter of Henry VIII. Um, and none of them seem to be thinking of the future. They're not saying, ah, well, who knows, the queen might die, we ought to be nice to this one. At this stage, oh. they're all just sorry for her, mm. or they're overcome by her obvious royalty. Mm. <laughs> Yes, because uh, yeah, if it's still uh, technically quite early in, in Mary's uh, reign, again, nobody is quite sure where 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 they, they, they stand or where the, 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 the succession will be going. So uh, there's, there's, uh, there's still a lot in play. Other thoughts uh, before we move on? I think we've sort of got our eye back in the game, uh, got a sense of where we are in the play. Um, so let's dig into scene as we're calling it 13. Enter Elizabeth Benningfield, Clarin, uh, Clarentia, Tame, Gage, and Berwick again. What fearful terror doth assail my heart? Good Gage, come hither and resolve me true. In thy opinion, shall I outlive this night? I prithee speak. Oh, outlive oh this night i pray madame why then to be plain this night i look to die <laughs> madame you were born to better fortunes that god that made you will protect you still from all your enemies that wish you ill my heart is fearful oh my honored lord as ever you were noble in your thoughts. Speak, shall my lady outlive this night or no? You much amaze me, sir, of heaven forfend. For if we should imagine any plot, pretending to the hurt of our dear mistress, I and my fellows, though far unable are, to stand against your power, will die together. And I with you would spend my dearest blood to do that virtuous lady any good. Sir Harry, now my charge and I must resign. The lady's wholly in your custody, yet use her kindly as she well deserves. And so I take my leave. Madam, adieu. And exit tame. My honoured lord, farewell. Unwilling I with grief and woe must continue. Help me to some ink and paper, good Sir Harry. What to do, madam? To write a letter to the Queen, my sister. I find that not in my commission. Good jailer, urge not thy commission. No jailer, but your guardian, madam. Then reach me pen and ink. Madam, I dare not, my commission serves not. Thus have you driven me off from time to time, still urging me with your commission. Good jailer, be not so severe. Good madam, I entreat you lose that name of jailer. It will be a byword to me and my posterity. So often as you name your commission, so often will I call you jailer. Say I should reach you, pen, ink, and paper, who is dare bear a letter sent from you. I do not keep a servant so dishonest that would deny me that. Whoever dares, none shall. Madame, impose the letter to my trust. 
were I to bear it through a field of pikes, and in my way 10,000 armed men ambushed, I'd make my passage through the midst of them and perforce bear it to the queen, your sister. Party of me, what a bold knave this. Gage, leave me to myself. Thou ever living power that guides to all hearts, give to my pen a true persuasive style that it may move my impatient sister's ears and urge her to compassionate my woe. And she writes, Benningfield takes a book and looks into it. What has she written here? Much suspected by me, nothing proved can be finis. Both Elizabeth the prisoner. Pray God it proves so. Soft, what book's this? Maria God, what's here, an English Bible? Oh, Santa Maria, pardon this profanation of my heart. Water, Beric, wa water! Ah, oh, meddle with it no more. My heart is heavy and my eye doth close, I am weary of writing. Sleepy on the sudden, Clarentina, Clarenita, Clarenitia? Leave me and command some music in the withdrawing chamber. And she sleeps. Your letter shall be forthcoming, lady. I will peruse it ere escape me now. Exit Benningfield. There is a dumb show. Enter Winchester, Constable Berwick and Friars. At the other door, two angels. The Friars step to her, offering to kill her. The angels drive them back. Exuant. The angel opens the Bible and puts it in her hand as she sleeps. Exuant angels, she wakes. Oh God, how pleasant was this sleep to me. Clarentia, sawst thou nothing? Madam, not I. I ne'er slept soundlier for the time. Nor heardst thou nothing? Neither, madam. D didst thou not put this book into my hand? Madam, not I. Then twas by inspiration. Heaven, I trust, with his eternal hand will guide the just. What chapter's this? Whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall not be confounded. My Saviour thanks, on thee my hope I build. Thou lovest poor innocence and art their shield. Enter Benningfield and Gage. Uh, here have you writ a long excuse, it seems, but no submission to the Queen, your sister. Should they submit that never wrought offence? The law will always quit wronged innocence. Gage, take my letter to the Lords, commend my humps. Gage, take my letter to the Lords, commend my humble duty. Madame, I fly to give this letter to Her Majesty, hoping, when I return, to give you comfort that now sadly mourn. Everybody exits apart from Benningfield. I do write and send. I'll cross you still. She shall not speak to any man alive, but he or hear her. No letter, nor no token shall ever have access unto her hands. But first I see it. So like a subject to my sovereign state, I will pursue her with my deadly hate. And enter Clown. Oh, Sir Harry, you look well to your office. Yonder's one in the garden with the princess. Oh, Nave, with the princess? She parted ere now. Aye, sir, that's all one. But she no sooner came into the garden, but he o'erlapped the wall, and there they are together, busy in talk, sir. Here's for thy pains. Thou art an honest fellow. Go, take a guard and apprehend them straight. Exit clown. Bring them before me. Oh, this was well found out. Now the queen commend my diligent care and praise me for my service to her grace. Uh, 
traitors. Swarm so near about my house. Mm, it's time to look into it. Oh, well said, Beric. Where's the prisoner? And enter clown Beric and soldiers leading a goat, his sword drawn. Here he is, in a string, my lord. Lord bless us, knave, what hast thou there? This is he I told you was busy in talk with the princess. What, what it did there you must out of him by examination. Why, oh, knave, this is a beast. So may your worship be for anything that I know. What art thou, knave? If your worship does not remember me, I hope your worship's cropper doth. But if you have anything to say to this honest fellow, who is foo for his gray head and reverent beard is so like, he may be akin to you. Akin to me, knave. I'll have thee whipped. Then your worship will cry quittance for my posteriors for misusing of yours. Nay, but dost thou flout me still? And once again, Benningfield beats the clown off stage. It's become a running gag. Um, so, so many things to talk about in this scene because it, it does all sorts of business. I, I think I'm just going to circle straight in on the... Um, the various exchanges uh, we we have Elizabeth Spheres, Elizabeth talking to her jailer. I loved that little bit of dialogue. I thought that was so strong. And then we get this dumb show where angels turn up, and I mean that's what the point where you're going. Okay, so far we're going to say, well, there's a bit of this, there's a bit of that. Okay, she's the hero. Literally, angels. She she's on the side of the angels. Um, there is uh, there is. No denying a certain level of uh, geography there. Um, you can't really walk, roll back from that one, can you? Um, and Beddingfield starts turning a bit moustache twirly, uh, just a, a little bit in the same way as the uh, the constable had earlier. Um, you know, the moment he finds an English Bible. <gasps> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Um, which, you know, is not a, a, a wholly unreasonable uh, reaction within the context of the play. Uh, I'll go to Aliki and other thoughts from around the room. So it, it also makes him superstitious. because he, he has to wash his hands from even having touched it. It's, you know, its eyes have glanced upon an English Bible. <laughs> um, and I'm really enjoying not so much the, the moustache twirling as, as his setup as the fall guy for all of the clown's pranks. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in one scene, we flip from psychological realism to dumb show to pratfalls to the entrance of a goat. <laughs> Just a note for future reference: you need a goat for this uh, for this play. Um, I mean, I, I I think you sort of have to warhorse it. Uh, I, I I think on practical level, um, but you know. Uh, we're all in favour for quadrupeds in, in plays. Normally we collect horses, but, you know, I'll settle for a goat. I'm cool with goats. Uh, and this goat has been discussing treason with the, the Lady Elizabeth <laughs> in well, the yeah. garden. <laughs> yep. <sighs> Absolutely. And he leapt over a wall to do it. Yep, yep. Uh, Alan. And, and according to the stage direction, the goat's got a sword. No, no, it's no, punctuated. No, no. Yeah, it's, it's, it is a good question. Who has their sword drawn? Is it Ber is Beric. that Benning is that Benningfield Beric. or Beric? Um, it's or the Beric. clown. Or the clown. <laughs> it's not very specific as to who whose sword is drawn. Um, I'm going to say the goat doesn't have a drawn sword. I mean, that's just taking that scene too far. Uh, other <laughs> thoughts in the room, uh, Rachel. Um, the parts with the clown. Uh, is this like a a, a part of theater psychology at the time that everybody must like exit when you s change a scene because you can't just like bring the house lights down or something like that. Um, uh, yeah, broadly speaking, yes. Um, you've got to find a practical way to get people on and off uh, stage. Um, uh, I'm not l looking at it. There doesn't seem to be a reason for the clown business in terms of practical stuff. Um, nobody who comes on stage in the next scene is in the previous scene. Um, so the clown business doesn't serve that sort of bridge function um, that sometimes clowns do. Um, Helen. 
I very much got the impression that the clown is one of the Lady Elizabeth's servants. Hmm. Well, um, we, the the clown, if it's the same Jersey. clown from the first half, uh, who briefly appeared there engaging with Gage and uh, and gentlewomen, so it could be, yeah. Mm. Clown is quite random, though. I have to say, the, the, there's something very random about this clown. Uh, other thoughts? I, I, I say, as I said at the beginning, I, I really quite like that sense that Elizabeth really doesn't know where she's 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 placed yet. You know, she's still there's still that fear. Am I going to die tonight? Mm. And Gage's relationship with Elizabeth is really interesting as well. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, quite intimate. And then this conversation with Benningfield, who's being made to feel really awkward and uncomfortable about his position and constantly talking about his commission. And then he goes off on one uh, and it, it's, the scene goes in a different direction. Uh, Helen. Yeah, I mean, the job of the custodian of a noble prisoner or somebody who is suspected of being involved in something treasonous would be to do exactly what he says, scrutinise everything incoming and outgoing and regulate who they meet with and never let them talk to somebody not being overheard. I mean, this is completely standard. Mm. And all this stuff about who, the letter, who's delivering the letter, what you're going to write, all of that stuff, you know, it's, it's, it's important control over, over this, this person. Um, mm. so. and, she's, and Elizabeth is not asking for pardon because she says mm. she hasn't done anything mm. that, to warrant it. Mm. which is fair enough um okay uh rachel um no i i was if, if there's a uh, other scenes in this where they do get stuff to her like how the other day um there's that whole scene with gage and they're juggling plates um as to how she'll be fed if there's something like that maybe you could integrate that with the clown that as the clown and Benning field are exiting, somebody slips something in if a production wanted to integrate that scene sort of in the plot as like having more than just funny clown business. Hmm. Yeah. Cause, um, where does the clown fit? Um, it, it feels more like it's Benningfield servant, actually. Weirdly, um, just um, it's just Benningfield. We've had we've had plays where um, evil people have been uh, given awful servants. Uh, so there's there's sort of because if it is the same clown, this is the problem with the generic name clown. Uh, it could technically be anyone. Um, anyway, we shall move on. Uh, pondering on those thoughts. Um, as we have scene 14, I may run that into the next couple of... We've got some short scenes that follow on afterwards. I may let them run together. Let's see what we get out of it. Enter Winchester, Gresham with paper, and Constable with a pursuivant. I pray your honour to regard my haste. I know your business, and your haste shall stay. As you were speaking, my Lord Constable, when, as the king, shall come to seal these writs? My lord, you know his highness treasure stays and cannot be transported these three months, unless that now your honour seal my warrant. Fellow, what then? This warrant that concerns the princess's death shuffle amongst the rest. He'll ne'er peruse it. How? The princess's death? Thanks, heavens. By whom am I made a willing instrument her life to save, that may live crowned when thou art in thy grave? Exit Gresham. Stand ready, Percivant, that when tis <coughs> signed thou mayst be gone and gallop with the wind. Enter Philip, Sussex, and Gage. Our Chancellor, Lords, this is our sealing day. This is our, this our state's business. Is our signet there? Enter Howard and Gresham as he is sealing. Stay your imperial hand. Let not your seal imprint death impress on your sister's heart. Our sister's heart? Lord Howard, what means this? The Chancellor and that injurious Lord can well expound the meaning. Oh, Chancellor Cust, how came he by this notice? 
Thy life is guarded by the hand of heaven, and we in vain pursuit. Lord Chancellor, your dealing is not fair. See, lords, what wits offer themselves to impress to the impress of our seal. See, my lord, a warrant for the princess' death before she be convicted. What juggling call you this? See, see, for God's sake. And a pursuivant, ready to post, away with it, to see it done with speed. What flinty breast could brook to see her bleed? Lord Chancellor, out of our prerogative, we will make bold to interline your warrant. Whose plot was this? The Chancellor's and my Lord Constable's. How was it revealed? By this gentleman, Master Gresham, the King's agent here. He hath showed his love to the King and Queen's Majesty, his service to his country, and care for of the Princess. My duty to them all. Instead of charging of the sheriffs with her, we here discharge her keeper, Benningfield, and where we should have brought her to the block. We now will have her brought to Hampton Court, there to attend the pleasure of the Queen, the pursuivant, that should have posted down with tidings of her death, bear her the message of her reprieved life. You, Master Gage, assist his speed. A good day's work we have made to rescue innocence so near betrayed. Uh, actually, I will pause here because, you know, Philip's getting a great press out of this play, isn't he? You know, he <laughs> genuinely is coming out, you know, going, yeah, great guy. You know, justice, yeah. fairness. Um, let's 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 reconcile everyone. He's he's a great reconciler, isn't he? You know, mm. I, I'm 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 big fan. I love the fact that he's got a, a set aside uh, day for sealing things. I think you know he's got a, a straightforward administrative ca uh, calendar for stuff, and uh, that does of course mean that other people can hijack that, knowing oh he's just going to do the stamping stuff, um, and uh, they can prep everything. But um, yeah, the, the the plot is foiled. Thoughts in the room about this scene. Um, yeah. I, I was not expecting Philip to get such a good press out of this play. <laughs> oh? mm. um, Helen. He's dead, of course, by the time this play is written. Yeah. And it's Philip III that they've been dealing with. But um, no, I mean, I mean, new best friends. Mm. Yeah. But, uh, uh, but it's all the fault of that wicked Bishop of Winchester. Mm. His boo. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yes. And as the play's gone on, it sort of solidified who the, the enemies are within... Uh, initially, it was a bit rough around the edges and the, the, everyone's got a little more entrenched as the play's uh, progressed. So I, I like the fact they're going, OK, well, I think Benningfield, he can, we can do without Benningfield now as well. So let's, let's separate Elizabeth from him and, and Winchester, etc. So... Um, yeah, there's some um, there's there's a there's a nice sense of the 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 the, the storm is passing from Elizabeth. But she came so close. Oh yeah, you know, real real danger, real threat. Uh, okay, we have a couple of short scenes that we will now engage with. Uh, scene fifteen, enter the clown, and uh, Clarentia. Okay. Will you go you so fast, Mistress Cl Clarentia? A milking. A milking? That's a poor office for a madam. Better be a milkmaid free than a madam in bondage. Oh, hast thou heard the princess yesternight, sitting within an arbour all alone? To hear a milkmaid sing, it would have moved a flinty heart to melt. Weeping and wishing, wishing and weeping, a thousand times she with herself debates with the poor milkmaid to exchange estates. She was a sempster in the tower, being a princess, and shall I, her poor gentlewoman, disdain to be a milkmaid in the country? Troth, you say true. Everyone to his fortune, his men go to hanging. The time has been when I would have scorned to carry coals, but now the case is altered. Every man as far as his talent will stretch. Enter a gentlewoman. Where's Mistress Crelantia? To horse, to horse. The princess is sent for to the court. She's gone already. Come, let's after. 
The princess gone, and I left here behind? Come, come, our horses shall outstrip the wind. And I'll not be long after you, for I am sure my kirtle will carry me as fast as your double gelding. And they exit. Scene 16, enter Elizabeth and Gage. I wonder, Gage, that we have laid so long so near the court, and yet have heard no news from our displeased sister. This more affrights me than my former troubles. I fear this Hampton court will be my grave. Good madame, blot such thoughts out of your mind. The lords, I know, are still about your suit, and make no doubt that, but they will so prevail, both with the king and queen, that you shall see their heinous anger will be turned to love. Enter Howard. Where is the princess? Welcome, my good lord Howard. What says the queen? Will she admit my sight? Madam, she will. This night she hath appointed that she herself in person means to hear you. Protract no time then. Come, let's haste away. And they exit. Scene 17. Uh, we are about to have the two sisters meeting. Uh, enter four torches. Philip, Winchester, Howard, Chandos, Benningfield and attendants. Where is the princess? She waits your pleasure at the common stairs. Usher her in by torchlight. Gentlemen, ushers and gentlemen pensioners, lights for the princess. Attendance, gentlemen. Our supposed virtues, royal queen, look on your sister with a smiling brow. And if her fault merit not too much hate, let her be censured with all lenity. Let your deep hatred end where it began. She hath been too long banished from the sun. Our favour shall be far above her desert, and she that hath been banished from the light shall once again behold our cheerful sight. You, my lord, shall step behind the arras and hear our conference. We'll show her grace, for there shines too much mercy in your face. We bear this mind, we errors would not feed, nor cherish wrongs, nor yet see innocence bleed. For the princess. Exuant for the princess. Philip behind the arras. Enter all with Elizabeth. All forbear this place, except our sister now. And everyone who just entered now exits, leaving Elizabeth and the Queen uh, visibly uh, present. That God that raised you, stay you and protect you from your foes and clear me from suspect. Wherefore do you cry to see yourself so low or us so high? Neither, dread Queen, mine is a womanish tear in part compelled by joy and part by fear, joy of your sight these brinish tears have bred, and fear of my queen's frown to strike me dead. Sister, I rather think they're tears of spleen. You were my sister, now you are my queen. Aye, that's your grief. Madam, he was my foe, and not your friend that hath possessed you so. I am as true a subject to your grace as any lives this day. Did you but see my heart? It bends far lower than my knee. We know you can speak well. Will you submit? My life, madam, I will, but not as guilty. Should I confess fault done by her that never did transgress? I joy to have a queen, a sister queen so royal. I would it as much pleased your majesty that you enjoy a sister that's so true. If I were guilty of the lead offence, madam would taint the blood even in your face. The treasons of the father being noble, unnobles all his children. 
let your grace exact all torture and imprisonment, whate'er my greatest enemies can devise, and when they have all done their word, yet I will your true subject and true sister die. Mirror of virtue and bright nature's pride, pity it had been such beauty should have died. You'll not submit then, but end as you begin. Madam, to death I will, but not to sin. You are not guilty then? I think I am not. I am not of your mind. I would your highness were. How mean you that? To think as I think that my soul is clear. You have been wrong imprisoned then? I'll not say so. Whate'er you think, arise and kiss our hand. Say God hath raised you, friends. Then God hath kept his promise. Promise? Why? To raise them friends that on his word rely. Enter Philip. And may the heavens applaud this unity. Accursed be they that first procured this wrong. Now, by my crown, you have been kept down too long. Sister, this night yourself shall feast with me. Tomorrow, for the country, you are free. Lights for the princess. Conduct her to her chamber. Exit Elizabeth. My soul is joyful that this peace is made, a peace that pleaseth heaven and earth and all, redeeming captive thoughts from captive thrall. Fair queen, the serious business of my father is now at hand to be accomplished. Of your fair sight needs must I take my leave. Return I shall, though parting cause us grief. Why should two hearts be forced to separate? I know your business, but believe me, sweet, my soul divines we never more shall meet. Yet, fair queen, hope the best. I shall return, who met with joy, though now sadly mourn. Exuant Philip and the Queen. Benningfield, Winchester, Constable, etc. are left on stage. Are we having some Benningfield issues, uh, Leaky? All right, you're muted. What droops, Your Honour? Sick. Where lies your grief? Where yours and all good subjects else should lie, near at the heart. This confirmation I do greatly dread, for now our true religion will decay. I do divine, whoever lives seven years shall see no religion here but heresy. Come, come, my lord, this is but for a show. Our queen, I warrant, wishes in her heart her sister princess without her head. No, no, my lords. This piece is natural. This combination is without deceit. But I will once more write to incense the queen. The plot is laid. Thus it shall be performed. Sir Harry, you shall go attach her servant upon suspicion of some treachery, wherein the princess shall be accessory. If this do fail, my policy is down but I grow faint. The fever steals on me. Death like a vulture tires upon my heart. I'll leave you two to prosecute the drift. My bones to earth I give. To heaven my soul I lift. Exit Winchester, possibly feeling a little unwell. Um, uh, possibly, possibly never seen again. Um, and uh, and uh, prophesying uh, that... Uh, in seven years time uh there might be some changes uh going on here what an interesting little scene um once again we got that moment we got elizabeth and and the queen um having a very cagey sort of saunter around each other there you know it's very careful 
Um, I, you know, you've been wrong in prison then. I'll not say so. <laughs> Um, yes, up to a point, Lord Copper. Um, yeah, very careful, very careful. Uh, Rachel. The um, top of this scene is so amazing that she's sitting at the, they call it the common stairs. I'm assuming that's for people who aren't nobility to come in on. Uh, and then also that she lets her in by torchlight and that Elizabeth's been in this tower uh, that's, you know, the only light she's probably seen is torchlight, that this is kind of an extended uh, psychological torture that uh, the queen might have in store for her, you know, in that they do this sort of like talking duel is is uh, kind of cool. Um, and that it uh, she wants to see this submission from Elizabeth. Yeah, and Philip, I'm really interested. Philip hiding behind the arras, um, which, uh, you know, he pops his head around at one point going, God, isn't Elizabeth lovely? Um, uh, you know, and it's just sort of going, hmm, hmm, um, yes, yes, Philip. And it's interesting that the, 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 the run into this is, you know, this relatively long scene, uh, relatively. It's, uh, there are very few long scenes in this entire play. Um, but we have these two very short scenes running into it. You know, we have the clown and uh, Clarentia um, doing a bit of uh, additional princess um, loveliness of this story about a, a milkmaid. And then someone comes in. No, no, they're already off to court. Oh, fuck, yeah, quick, get on a horse. Um, and then we have the anticipation from Elizabeth's side, Elizabeth talking to Gage, preparing to go in, and then they enter. So it's these, these short little scenes to build expectation for the big scene. And the big scene on the whole works very nicely. Um uh, Lynn. Yeah, another scene like we saw in the, the first half where what's not said is more important than what's said, where subtext is everything. And there's so many different ways you could play this. I mean, Mary could genuinely accept Elizabeth's submission and say, oh, OK, I think she's on the level. I guess things are OK now or or not or just the opposite. So. Yeah, what a what a fun scene for a couple of actors to um, to work through and decide what's going on. Mm, yeah, and uh, I think Aliki Ali just said in the uh, the chat, just uh, talking about the cinematic quality for this. I mean, this does feel very much like a film script. Actually, you know, you can see it. You know, normally with plays, you have to sort of cut and thing and push and do stuff. But actually, this is very concise. It moves very quickly and it's got lots of really short scenes that flow into each other. It feels like a film already, actually, um, me, yeah. with just 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 some minor tweaks, uh, which, you know, that that, that uh, and we were. Yes, it was yesterday. We were talking about the, the sort of tightness of some of the scenes and, the, you know, it could be all done on quite a small budget with just cameras locked on people's faces um yeah um other thoughts anyone wants to throw in we're, we're getting towards the end uh rachel helen put it in the chat that uh mary always thought that elizabeth was like illegitimate from the second marriage um and it really comes out that i think this is a that just that hashing out of their past so much uh just from that greeting because like i can't imagine that you would even if somebody's like imprisoned that you'd welcome nobility to a palace um by torchlight and sending all these people away uh lynn yeah the, uh, as you know, relating to that uh, idea of legitimacy, there's actually no way technically that both Mary and Elizabeth could be legitimate mm. because uh, Mary's mother was still alive when when um, Elizabeth was born. So either Henry's marriage to Catherine of Aragon was valid and Elizabeth is illegitimate or it wasn't and Mary is illegitimate. There's There's no way legally, technically, they could both be legitimate but they were named in the act of succession 
So that kind of overrides any d- anything else. Mm. Uh, and also just the way the scene closes um, with this little exchange between Philip and and, and Mary um, and that sense of a parting and the, the Queen. Yeah. Everyone's prophesying at the end of this scene. The Queen's going, yeah. I don't think I'm going to see you again. Um, and Winchester says, I, I think I might be off popping off in a bit um and yeah there's there's nobody's talking about um you know a succession or 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 or, uh, pregnancy or any of those 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 uh, elements in mary's life um but uh yeah they're kind of important Mm. (laughs) yeah whether or not we're going to have an heir that's kind of important yeah but they're actually just focusing on on quite realistic relationships between the queen philip and elizabeth and you know and uh, and they're not they're actually not banging on a drum at this point uh, about yeah. some of those things which is quite interesting choices uh helen it's really yeah i mean the real elephant in the room is the is the burnings because there's absolutely no mention of which fox is of course full of uh, of the the, the 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 Protestant martyrs that are being burnt all around them at this yeah. time, I mean that just doesn't appear. Yeah, we're we're getting towards the end of the play, and you know, spoilers. Uh, Mary might not see the 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 end of this uh, narrative. Um, and you know, and we were uh, uh, talking yesterday about you know Bloody Mary and that reputation. You know, that that stuff is sort of. You know, um, uh, but this play is not interested in that. So uh, that's not what this play is about. This play does not ca- clearly does not want to go there, um, uh, which is uh, probably fair enough, because broadly speaking, you don't put religion on the stage. Uh, you don't do morality plays uh, talking about the nature of re- uh, religion. Uh, this is being quite cagey um, about that. Uh, Sarah. It's interesting, though, because um, even though the play does not engage with that, and, you know, that's probably a very smart choice on the part of the playwright, um, you could you could actually, because I was just thinking all, all that uh, all that prophecy business with people thinking, oh, I'm not going to see you again, or I'm going to die shortly, it kind of creates a bit of a weird, feverish atmosphere at, at the end of that scene, which if you, if you tie that together with the tortures, with with um, with Mary's mention of the, uh, the the tortures at the beginning when when Elizabeth comes in and then she says lights at the princess lights for the princess conducted to her chamber at the end, you could actually have um, you know lit torches there. You could have you could have a sudden blaze on stage while while first the Queen and then Winchester are prophesying about death. And although it's it's got nothing to do with Protestant martyrs, obviously, for people who know their history, uh, it would perhaps create some kind of interesting performance resonance and echo. Because like I said yesterday, I don't think you can escape the history with this play. So it's just a question of how, how much you kind of lean into it. And, and you could lean into it in this scene in quite an interesting way if you wanted to for, for people who were who were thinking about it. Yeah, there might be a much more prosaic reason for uh, these references to torches, which we'll come to in a bit. Um, sure. But that doesn't mean we can't interpret and use that use that data. Um, uh, Helen. Yeah, sorry, I was just going to say that I saw the torches as a sign of favour mm. uh, rather mm. than anything else. Um, yeah, I think that's how they're meant. But I was just thinking from a yeah. a modern staging perspective, you could actually, they could serve a, a, a double meaning. Mm. If you want to engage with the uh, the emergency services um, and and get that 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 properly sorted, um, that 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 uh, feel free to do that in your production, but I don't want to do the paperwork. Um, uh, <laughs> so, uh, scene eighteen, um, we have a, another short scene, um, a, a dumb show, and then another um, uh, and another scene. So uh, we'll run these two together. Uh, scene eighteen, enter Gage and Clarin. Madame Clarentia, is my lady stirring? Yes, Master Gage, but heavy at the heart, for she was frightened with a dream this night. 
She said she dreamed her sister was new married and sat upon an high imperial throne that she herself was cast into a dungeon where enemies environed her about offering their weapons to her naked breast. Nay, they would scarcely give her leave to pray. They made such haste to hurry her away. Heaven shield my mistress and make her friends increase. Convert her foes, estate her into peace. <laughs> Then did I dream of weddings and of flowers. Methought I was within the finest garden that ever mortal eye did yet behold. Then straight methought some of the chief were picked to dress the bride. Oh, t'was the rarest show to see the bride go smiling long the streets, as if she went to happiness eternal. Oh, most unhappy dream, my fear is now as great as yours before it was but small, come. Let's go comfort her that joys us all. And we go into scene 19. Enter a dumb show with six torches. Uh, Sussex bearing the crown. Howard bearing the scepter. The constable, the mace. Uh, Tame the purse. Chandos the sword. We had similar in the first scene. Philip and Mary uh, enter. After them the cardinal pool. Benningfield and attendants. Philip and Mary confer. He takes leave and exits. Nobles uh, bring him to the door and return. Mary falls in a swoon and they comfort her. A dead march plays. Enter four with the hearse of Winchester. With the sceptre and purse lying on it. The queen takes the sceptre and purse, gives it to Cardinal Poole. A senate and exuant omnes apart from Sussex. Winchester dead. Oh, God, even at his death he showed his malice to the sweet young princess. God pardon him, his soul must answer all. She's still preserved, and he, still her foes do fall. The queen is much besotted on these prelates, for there's another raised, more base than he. Poor, that arch, for truth and honesty. Enter Benningfield. My lord of Sussex. I can tell little news that Cardinal Poole, that now is firmly well, is suddenly fallen sick and, and like to die. Let him go. Why then, there's a fall of prelates. This realm will never stand in perfect state till all their faction be clear ruin it. Enter Constable. Sir Harry, do you hear the whispering in the court? They say the Queen is crazy, very ill. How heard you that? Tis common through the house. Enter Howard. It is a sad court, my lord. What's the matter? How fares the queen? Whether in sorrow for the king's departure, or else for grief at Winchester's decease, or else that Cardinal Poole is suddenly dead, I cannot tell, but she's exceeding sick. The state begins to alter. Nay, more, my lord. I came now from the presence. I heard the doctors whisper it in secret. There is no way but one. God's will be done. Who's with the Queen, my lord? The Duke of Norfolk and the Earl of Oxford, the Earl of Arundel and diverse others. They are withdrawn into the inward chamber, there to take counsel and entreat your presence. I'll wait upon their honours. Exuant omnes. Uh, so, oh, oh. Yeah. we've got prophesying we've got dreams uh and we've got like flies. we've got that we've got the, uh, the i don't know it, it feels awfully like uh, uh god is smiting down her enemies here doesn't it there's an awful lot of prelates dropping dropping their clocks <laughs> um and 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 now the the queen herself is on her way uh helen uh, uh I, I i hate to say this but it was a pandemic <laughs> um no, no i mean it i mean it uh, 15, um, uh, 58 9 was an absolutely massive pandemic. Enormous numbers died, um, including Cardinal Poole, who is not what the guy says he was. The guy says he was a, a, a um, low, low birth. This is absolute nonsense. He was a Plantagenet, and, and the Queen called him cousin. Um, uh, but but no the the um, 
she never knew that Poole had died. Uh, she died. The, they died the same day. But it was a it was a pandemic. Absolutely, a influenza, yeah. bird uh, flu. Uh, are we uh, thinking that base is uh, meaning uh, breeding, or just simply that he's just as much of a git as uh, as uh, uh, Winchester was? I don't. I don't know. But either way, it's not so. Um, yeah, well, the plague says the play says it is. So, uh, so it's so fair it's enough. true. Um... <laughs> Butch your son from Ipswich, undoubtedly. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, that that sense of of divine justice sort of creeping in here um, without going full. I mean, we had angels earlier. They could have brought in some angels to do some smiting, I suppose. It's really interesting. Uh, Aliki. Can I just point out that Elizabeth's intuition is always wrong? Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Mm. Yeah, her dream is, is again full of terrors and, uh, and, 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 and fears. Um, and actually everything's going to be fine. I mean, she doesn't see the angels when the angels do their thing. She just finds the book. So, you know, if she just opened her eyes a little earlier, she would have gone, oh, no, it's all cool. <laughs> uh, Rachel. Yeah, she has that dream. And then the servant has a, has dreams of marriage. Um, but neither of those things happen to her. So what is that supposed to mean? Like it doesn't happen. Neither of them happen in reality. So what does that mean in this play? That dreams don't mean anything. <laughs> they always mean the world something. is the world is just random. Um, <laughs> Lynn uh, muted at the moment. Uh, actually, I think I would argue that Clarentia's dream does come true metaphorically. Elizabeth is wedded to her realm, mm. and she and she um, portrayed herself as that. You know, she had a a coronation ring that she didn't wasn't removed from her finger till she was basically on her deathbed, um, and her hands were so swollen that it was causing her pain. Uh, so yeah, Cl Clarentia's dream is symbolically true. She'll be she will be wedded to her realm. To her mm. people mm. and i like the fact that it's it's a little ambiguous um this stuff uh that there is room for for maneuver that uh productions can push it different directions um <laughs> i like it when you can push the plays in different directions because yeah. it keeps mm. it fresh um uh, let's go to scene 20 um and once again we have elizabeth gage and clarentia above above Oh God, my last night dreams, I greatly fear it doth presage my death. Good Master Gage, look to the pathway that doth come from the court. I look each minute for death's messenger. Would he were here now, so my soul were pure, that I with patience might the stroke endure. Madame, I see from far a horseman coming, this way he bends his speed. He comes so fast that he is covered in a cloud of dust, and now I have lost his fight. He appears again, making his way over hill, hedge, ditch, and plain. When after him, they two strike, as on the race they had wagered both their lives, another after him. Oh God, what means this haste? Pray for my soul. My life cannot long last. Strange and miraculous, the first being at the gate, his horse hath broke his neck and cast his rider. This same is but a prologue to my death. My heart is guiltless, though they take my breath. Enter Sir Henry Carew. God save the Queen! God save Elizabeth! God save the Queen! So all good subjects say, I am her subject and for her still pray. My horse did your allegiance at the gate, for there he broke his neck and there he lies. But I myself had much ado to rise. The fall hath bruised me, yet I live to cry, God bless your grace, God bless your majesty. Long live the queen, long live your majesty. This news is sweet. 
my heart was sore afraid. Rise thou, first baron that we ever made. Thanks to your majesty, happy be my tongue, that first breathed right to one that had such wrong. Enter Sir John Brockett. Am I prevented in my haste? Oh, chance accursed! My hopes did soothe me that I was the first. Let not my duty be o'erswayed by spleen. Long live my sovereign, and God save the Queen. Thanks, good Sir John. We will deserve your love. And next, coming to the post on the uh, messenger race, enter Howard. Though third in order, yet the first in love, I tender my allegiance to your grace. Live long, fair queen, thrice happy be your reign. He that inflates you, your high state maintain. Lord Howard, thanks. You were ever our friend. I see your love continues to the end. But chiefly, thanks to you, my Lord of Hunston. Meaning this gentleman? The very same. His tongue was first proclaimer of our name, and trusty Gage, in token of our grace, we give you a captain pensioner's place. Madam, the council are here hard at hand. We will descend and meet them. Let's guard our sovereign, praising that power that can throw down and raise within an hour. Enter the clown and one more with faggots of wood. Come, neighbour, come away. Every man is faggot and his double pot for the joy of the old queen's death. Let bells ring, let children sing, and we may have cause to remember the 17th day of November. Enter Lord of Tame. And now, my masters, what's here to do? Faith making bonfires for the joy of the new queen. Come, sir, your penny, and you be a true subject. You'll battle with us for your faggot. We'll be merry in faith. And you do well, and yet me think twere fit to spend some funeral tears upon her hearse, who, while she lived, was dear unto you all. Ay, but do you know the old proverb? We must live by the quick, and not by the dead. Did you not love her father when he lived, as dearly as you e'er did love any, and yet rejoiced at his funeral? Likewise her brother, you esteemed him dear, Yet once departed, joyfully you sung. Run to make bonfires, to proclaim your love unto the new, forgetting still the old. Now she is gone, how you moan for her. Were it not fit a while to mourn her hearse, and dutifully then rejoice for the other? Had you the wisest and the lovingest prince that ever swayed a sceptre in the world, that this is the love he shall leave after life? Let princes, while they live, have love or fear, tis fit, for after death as none continues it. By my faith, my masters, he speaks wisely. Come, we'll to the end of the lane, and there we'll make a bonfire and be merry. Faith agreed, I'll spin my eight knee towards another faggot, rather than that the new queen shall want a bonfire. And they exit apart from tame. I blame you not nor do I you commend, for you will still sit, you will still the strongest side defend. Exit. Um, okay, so in a sign of obeisance to the natural queen, uh, a horse has snapped its own neck um, <laughs> to make sure that it bows. Um, uh, the second week in the row that we've had gratuitous horse death, um, as, <laughs> as I think Sarah put in the chat. Um, so, um, though we haven't confirmed the death of the previous horse, um, this horse definitely died. I mean, it's this, the, the way Gage is describing this. Oh, okay, there's someone coming in, there's someone coming over there, there's two more behind it, and the runners are, and, 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 <laughs> and yes. Um, in the, uh, the tel telling the new monarch that they're Queen's steeplechase, uh, <laughs> crew got there, um, by a head. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's got that sort of quality to it, but also it's this uh, sense of people swearing their allegiance as quickly as possible. People who are, some of them are a bit on the fancy. Some of them are more pro and some, pen so there's something interesting about hip hypocrisy there. And then Tame coming in and, you know, as the, the, the common folk are having fun, uh, just going, hang on, could you just wait a bit? 
um, to be a bit sad for five minutes that the Queen's dead. Nope. Nope. Elizabeth isn't <laughs> sad. She doesn't, you know, she's told she's Queen and she doesn't go, oh, poor old Mary. No, no. I, I think it's the stress. Oh, she's been really worried for a, the whole play. A lot of stress there. Anxiety dreams galore for Elizabeth. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, Rachel, then Helen. Yeah. Um, I wonder if in performance when she, uh, where was it? Who does she call, who does she name the first baron of her, her reign? Uh, Carew, yes, the first one who arrived. Uh, he wins the uh, the the messenger steeplechase. Yeah, him. I wonder if, like, uh, if if uh, I don't know how somebody does that, or if it's something like she puts her hand on his shoulder, and she's just so relieved of it because I think the horse is breaking their neck. You know, she thinks it's somebody coming to tell her that she's going to be. Uh, executed and coming to warn her uh, uh sadly she can't do that because she's above on the balcony um oh so they're at a great height looking down on the messengers uh which may explain why she's not doing any sort of real emotion that she's doing something more performative because she's uh standing above the people who are shouting up I feel that Howard and Et and uh, Brockett should come on the moment they're on stage just go oh um, when they see the other person, I, I, I feel that they need to really be quite teed off. Um, uh, Helen. Uh, yeah, the thing is that this is in fact all about James's, um, this race to tell the, 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 the king or the new monarch that the old monarch is dead, in fact took place for James. Hmm. Um, and there was this mad rush to Edinburgh, and it was a it was a regular steeplechase, and horses <laughs> did get ki get killed in the process, um, but it didn't happen for Elizabeth. But no, you don't didn't. you're not it did in the play I know, and the history is utterly irrelevant. Fair <laughs> enough. I was I actually going to say it, it it didn't in Elizabeth R, which is the you know our other <laughs> core text for this. Uh, you know, someone just casually sauntered up to uh, to uh, Glenda Jackson and handed her a ring or something, <laughs> uh, and that thus ended uh, ended uh, episode one. Yes, yeah. Also, I mean, there's an awful lot else that's wrong with this, but I won't go into it because you don't want to know. We will next time. Next time you can let rip. Uh, the second look, which uh, I, I, I feel is uh, this is a very ripe candidate for second looks because um, we can definitely do it in one session as well, which I always like with the second look. Um, so, yeah. Uh, other thoughts, Lynn? Well, yeah, I, I remember Elizabeth R. And gosh, I enjoyed it. Um, um, but the story of her sitting under a tree reading when she got the news that um, her sister had died and she was queen. Isn't that actually from a contemporary account or or a, a, a near contemporary account? That's that's a story that was in circulation when this play was written, I think. So it's a deliberate choice to have her be elevated and kind of above it all, rather than that that sort of more quotidian scene that that we saw portrayed in other popular culture mm. uh, renditions mm. of this story. So that, that, that's also just in itself, that choice is interesting. Yeah, and also the, the whole clown and tame scene is very much a bridge scene as well here for setting up what we're about to have in the final scene of the play. Uh, Helen. Yeah, uh, um, following from what Lynn said, she actually had her memorable quote prepared ready because she knew in fact that the queen was dying because mm -hmm. William Cecil was already managing matters for her and um, she said uh, this is the Lord's doing and this is wonderful in our sight which is the second line of a psalm verse the first of which is the stone that the builder rejected the same hath been made the head of the corner because she was the stone that the builder had rejected, but she's now on top. Um, 
Anyway, we go to once again fi- totally irrelevant. Sorry. Final scene. Final. Yes, because the playwright has no interest in that ver- that that version of history. Um, uh, and actually, there's a really good question actually about Elizabeth's role in this play and Elizabeth's later role in the in the second part as well. Um, uh, we'll hold up on that for the moment, but uh, there is an interesting question about uh, the way Elizabeth is portrayed uh, throughout this play. Um, which we'll come to in a bit. Scene 21, as we have it. Uh, a senate into four trumpeters. After them, sergeant trumpeter with a mace. After him, purse bearer, Sussex with the crown. Howard, the scepter, constable, my cap of maintenance. Chandos with the sword. Tame, all the people with the stuff. Uh, tame with the collar and, the, uh, uh, and a George. Uh, four gentlemen bearing the canopy over the queen. Two gentlemen bearing up her train. Six gentlemen pensioners. Everybody who they can hire for this particular moment. And the queen <laughs> takes state. All together now. Long live the sovereign. Long live the sovereign. Long sovereign. We thank you all. The imperial crown I here present your grace. With it, my staff of office and my place. While we this crown so long your while we this crown so long your place enjoy. The imperial scepter here I offer up. Keep it, my lord and with it be you High Admiral. This cap of maintenance I present, my staff of office and my utmost service. Your love, we know. <laughs> Pardon me, gracious madam, t'was not spleen, but that allegiance that I owed my queen. Madam, I served her truly at that day, and I as truly will your grace obey. We do as freely, pardon, as you truly serve. Only your staff of office we will displace. Instead of that, we'll owe you greater grace. Enter Benningfield. Long live the Queen, and long live your Majesty. I had read hard to be the first reporter of these glad tidings first, and then all these here. You are in your love as free as in your care. You're come even just a day after the affair. The fair. What's he? My jailer. God preserve your grace. Oh, be not ashamed, ma'am. Look me in the face. Who have you now to patronize your strictness on? For your kindness, this we will bestow. When we have won, we would have hardly used and cruelly dealt with. You shall be the man. This is a day for peace, not vengeance fit. All your good deeds will quit. All wrongs remit. Where we left off, proceed. The sword of justice on my bended knee, I to your grace present. Heaven bless your reign. The sword is ours. This staff is yours again. This garter with the order of the George, two ornaments unto the crown of England, I here present. Possess them still, my lord. What offices bear you? I, Captain of Your Highness, Pensioners. I, of Your Guard. I, Sergeant Trumpeter, present my mace. Some we intend to raise, none to displace. Lord Hunston, we will one day find a staff to pays your hand. You are our cousin and deserve to be employed nearer our person. But now to you, from whom we take this staff, since Cardinal Pole is now deceased and dead, to show all malice from our breast is worn, before you let that person mace be born. And now to London lords, lead on the way, praising that king that all kings else obey. Senate about the stage in order. The mayor of London meets them. I, from this city, London, do present this purse and Bible to your majesty. A thousand of your faithful citizens in velvet coats and chains, well mounted, 
Stay to greet thy royal sovereign on the way. We thank you all. But first this book I kiss. Thou art the way to honor, thou to bliss. An English Bible. Oh, thanks, my good Lord Mayor. You of our body and our soul have care. This is the jewel that we still love best. This was our solace when we were distressed. This book that hath so long concealed itself, so long shut up, so long hid. No, Lord, see, we here unclasp, forever it is free. Who looks for joy, let him this book adore. This is true food for rich men and for poor. Who drinks of this is certain ne'er to perish. This will the soul with heavenly virtue cherish. Lay hand upon this anchor every soul. Your name shall be in an eternal scroll. Who builds on this dwells in a happy state. This is the fountain, clear, immaculate. That happy issue that shall us succeed. And in our populous kingdom, this book read. For them, as for ourselves, we humbly pray. They may live long and blessed. So lead the way and the next episode of queen elizabeth's book club will be uh, uh out uh next week and uh yeah it would be awkward if she was holding up 40 shades of gray or something um <laughs> uh, you know <laughs> oh uh yeah that final that final uh bit with the mayor um yeah less less keen on um but some of the stuff that went before i really love i just thought that i and i think you played it absolutely right uh when the constable steps up and you your love we know um <laughs> i mean yeah such a great great bit of uh bit of work and um yeah and, and, and you know this thing of going well i i'm gonna pardon you for anything you've done wrong but you might not keep your job just just that uh, might be there might be some awkward there might you know might change and i'm not going to punish anyone now it's a happy day um you know we'll quietly rearrange the pack later um yeah so there's some really interesting just little bits and i just love the way she just turns to uh, having said all that goes goes right where were we um next <laughs> next part of the ceremony oh yeah you're in next um just just give me me cue will you oh thank you I like the bit at the end where she prays for James. Though obviously, the happy issue that shall us succeed. For them as for ourselves, we humbly pray. Hmm. Well, that's James. This book read. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm interested by that final speech by the mayor and elizabeth because it does feel like the play's ended and that this bit feels like it might have been added um it feels like it feels oddly tacked on because uh, it feels like we've, we've 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 kind of we've kind of done done the stuff um but maybe not maybe not it, it does, well, it I, does think it... The, I think the the praise of the english bible of a bible in english mm. is is central because we did have angels delivering it earlier. So. Absolutely. <laughs> mm. uh, Sarah, then Rachel. Yeah, the, the end of the previous speech, and now to London Lords lead on the way, praising that king that all kings else obey. If this was a cinematic version, it would end there. There's, there's no doubt about it. I, I think that's, that's, the, that's the natural end where they ride off into the sunset towards London. Um, but then I kind of like the bit with the mayor and Elizabeth at the end because it is a bit it's a bit pageanty, isn't it? It's a bit like, oh, let's just stick a Lord Mayor show on the end <laughs> on the end of the play. <laughs> it was a joyous entree. It was a it was a a, a royal entry. Yeah, there would have been pageants. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we do have uh, we've got lots of accounts of some of uh, 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 I think we've got uh, of some of uh, uh, Elizabeth's entries to things. So uh, we haven't got around to doing those yet, but we do have texts. So there might be an interesting crossover thing that we might be able to do with that. Um, who was next? Rachel, I think. The like, last two speeches, like 
Is it? Yeah, because it does sound pageanty and those those things. I wonder if it just means the actors who are playing Mayor and Elizabeth. Um, if this is the point at which they like turn to the audience and they give the, you know, even though there's not these religion plays anymore, you know how they sort of turn, you like would turn at the end of those and then give the moral lesson that you should derive from this. And that's the, I guess that moral led, uh, the moral lesson is this, this English Bible right here. Yeah, the, the, the He-Man music plays in the background and we find out what we've all learned. Uh, Lynn, uh, you're muted at the moment. so It doesn't, it, it, I, I mean, I understand the argument that it doesn't feel super, these last two speeches don't feel super integrated. I mean, you have a rhyming couplet, um, weigh and obey, and then, um, you know, that's, has that sort of clinchy feel, but the, uh, these the mayor and Elizabeth at the end have a kind of epilogue feel to me. And epilogues were actually quite, quite common in 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 this period, too, where a, a character kind of semi comes out of the play and breaks that that division between the audience and the and the performers and says, "Hi guys, um, please applaud for us if it's a comedy or um, oh gosh, isn't the monarch cool?" Uh, we love that person, <laughs> you know, that's, that's in a way, this is also really typical of the period that where you suck up to the monarch a little at the end of the play in the form of an epilogue. Yeah, I, I, it, I think it's the, the issue of, you know, it's we get a bit of them wandering around for a bit and then the Lord <laughs> Mayor, you know, if the Lord Mayor just turned up and said, hi, um, I, I probably wouldn't be questioning it. It's just the fact we have this Senate around about the stage in order and then the Lord Mayor of London meets them. Uh, I, you know, I'm sure that could be spectacular and look fab, but it also feels sort of weird. But that may be just me. Uh, so I'm going to roll back on that and uh, not not push it too, more, uh, too much. Other thoughts? Elizabeth, then Sarah, then Lalit. Is it me, or did we kind of gloss over the death of Mary? Because she swooned a little bit in one of the dumb shows, and then she was just gone. Yeah, <laughs> there was I a scene thought... where someone said she's a bit ill, and then she was dead. Yeah. And she was just gone. I just, I know that her reign was very short. I think she only reigned for about five years. But I do think that she's been such a pivotal character in the text so far that she deserved a little bit more. More, more Mary, more Mary. A little bit um, more Mary towards the end. She should have got a death scene. You know. Yeah. Yeah, but That's you know, so good at death scenes. She's yeah. she's she's not on the title, so uh, so good. she doesn't get that. Um, I'm hoping we see Philip again next time. Uh, Sarah, then Lalit. Uh, this isn't what I was going to say, but, but but you could actually put a death scene in. Um, I, I I was thinking um, it would be quite interesting to play with the idea of turning the dumb shows into Elizabeth's fever dreams. Um, and and you could actually add in an extra one uh, where she has a, a fever dream about Mary dying, Mary on her deathbed. It, obviously, you know, no, no text involved, just a dumb show. Uh, and then she wakes up and then of course she won't know like with all her other dreams, whether it's actually real or whether it's it's not. Uh, because as Aliki pointed out earlier, she's, she's not very good at the old prophesying. <laughs> but if she's having all these anxiety dreams it's, it's fair enough um what i wanted to say was about uh following on from what rachel and lynn said about the epilogue uh a sort of epilogue quality to, to this uh mayor and, and final speech it just struck me as just being quite amusing because like quite often the epilogue uh is is literally a big speech that finishes with oh and you know, God save the Queen is the we all love the Queen, and she's fabulous. And thank you very much, and good night. We're here all week, and effectively, you've got Elizabeth delivering her own epilogue in this play. And I mean, okay, so she it, it changes because instead of talking about herself, she's talking about the English Bible. Uh, but I, I just, it just occurred to me that within the context of when this would have been played. Um, that must have tickled the audience because usually they would get an epilogue where it's all about like God save the Queen and here you've actually got the Queen delivering the epilogue about something else entirely. So that must have been quite entertaining. Mm, Lalit. I, I just have noticed with all the supporting parts, almost like the lower down the social scale, the more kind of individualised and memorable the parts because I ended up playing tame 
Sussex and Howard. And quite honestly, if the names hadn't been next, <laughs> I wouldn't know which was which. I mean, I'm not that, you know, I'm not saying I had the skill to do that much differentiating, but I do wonder how in kind of performance you managed to kind of differentiate between three guys who kind of basically have the same attitude and the same sort of status. Well, there was, we were discussing this a bit yesterday about um, you know, saying, you know, my usual instinct is to reduce the number of courtiers uh, who do mm. similar jobs, but actually their multiplicity seemed quite important. Mm. And that even though they don't seem to be, uh, you know, there, there does seem to be some graduation between them as to their allegiance. And especially as we get to the end here, when we've got several people coming on and uh, who are there to try and gain favour and then people at the end trying to gain favour as well that actually it's sort of important that we have lots of people who we're not quite sure precisely where they're placed um, and how that flows. And in performance, I think it will be clearer, whereas mm. it, as a script, it isn't. I think that's mm. the big problem with plays like this is that reading the play as opposed to performing it are quite different acts. Because this it, it moves very quickly. It doesn't hang around on any character very long. We don't have that many set speeches. It's not trying to be um, overt with its uh, poeticking and uh, and other uh, business. It's getting on and telling a story. Um, and so really, actually, it's, it's going to be when we get to the second look that I think we'll probably get a real sense of how this play functions. Uh, we're going to go into final thoughts. Uh, and I want to uh, make sure that we... Uh, we pop through uh, everyone. Um, just a little, little, set a little hair running. Um, just the question of, of Elizabeth herself as a character as well. Um, you know, she's quite passive throughout this. She's always reacting and always with fear. Um, I think Elizabeth uh, uh, made this point in the first session actually quite early on and is going, well, she's a bit wet. Um, she's not the figure that we're expecting. She does grow uh, at the very end. Um, but, you know, even just before she finds out she's queen, she's still going, oh, God, I dreamt about dying again last night. Um, and and yeah, and, and what we what we do with that central figure and... Uh, uh, that does that. Uh, and other thoughts uh, now that m pretty much all of us here have uh, been here for the two sessions. So uh, overview of the play overall, I'll go to Elizabeth first for final thoughts. Yeah, well, just thinking about what you what you were just saying about the character of Elizabeth in the text. I think that to what to some extent, the, the author, the playwright is trying to make us aware that she is in danger that she is in real danger of losing her life, that it wasn't just like a whim of Queen Mary. There was a real concerted effort to try and take her head off, you know, so, so that we feel the peril that Elizabeth is in and we feel how aware she is of her circumstances and how precarious her circumstances are. I think that's, that is a, definitely a very strong element to the text yeah it's that age-old problem how do you build tension in a play where you already know how it's going to end you know uh, yeah. you know un you know unless we we go entirely counter historical and, and chop her head off um <laughs> it, uh you know we know it's going to end happily so how do you build the tension and that seems to be what haywood is constantly doing is just going it's it's there's there's the the the, the struggle is real um and the fear is real uh alan any final thoughts I'm, I must admit, I've enjoyed it. And I think it does show the fact, I mean, as we had that rather odd prologue, um, you know, which is obviously written sometime after the original piece had been produced, that this had been well worked in, well rehearsed. Uh, I'm sure it had been tweaked during the process to make it work. And it does flow remarkably well. I haven't come across any bits of it really, which I feel would be beneficial to John. Unlike many of the things we've done where I'm thinking, yeah, well, there's about three pages there you could quite happily lose. Um, and that's on the better ones. Um, it does work. And I think a pace, it would work incredibly well. Um, <coughs> it'd be quite fiddly because of the sheer number of bodies coming on and off at various points but um there seems also to be a nice mix of 
you get the sort of the rather intense court scenes, historical scenes, and then you get these little comedy numbers just to break it up. Mm. Some of which I'm not sure actually work that well outside a physical theatre environment. You know, the pratfall when the clown nicks Benningfield's chair, for example, it would be a difficult one to do in this medium, I think. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. I think uh, horses for courses. Um, uh, so, yeah, the, the, a couple of the clown things do feel slightly over, over, over-egged, over but um, hey, let's see what an audience says about it. Uh, Lalit, any final thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I, I was thinking that I, I, you get glimpses of the character that one thinks of as Queen Elizabeth, particularly at the end when she kind of calls out the, the constable, whereas there are other parts when she's much more presented as, you know, the virtuous lady and she feels like a kind of propaganda for, for you know, um, Christian duty. And, that, and those bits left me a bit colder than the parts where one had more of a sense of, of, of um, how sharp she could be. Uh, Bryony, any final thoughts? Um, I I struggled a bit with this one, and I don't know if it's me and just how my brain is this week, or if it was the play. But I didn't really, I didn't feel that connected to it. I didn't get that into it. Um, it didn't light my fire. Hmm. Uh, it's 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 a uh, it's an important point because of course we may be to a degree projecting onto this play uh, our, our interest in, in Elizabeth and, uh, and narratives and if uh, we're invested in that we may be overlooking some of the flaws in the play that we would like it to be a bit uh, thicker as it were uh, in places um, uh, I, I think I think this is definitely one where, where performance is going to make the, the big difference because some of it is spe- it's a spectacle and pageantry. Uh, back to Bryony. There were a couple of characters as well that, that just didn't do a lot like Ber- Beric today I don't know what the point of him was he was in a lot of scenes he had about two lines he didn't move the story anywhere for me he didn't yeah I don't know yeah uh is there a, a a contraction of some of these parts and some of these characters is that beneficial um is there some editorial work and of course uh as the prologue complains uh you know this text may not be wholly accurate as to what the original pre- play text mm. was um so uh there there are some questions of course we can ask about that there's nothing we can do about it of course we've got the text we've got um but uh yeah there there, there may be elements there as uh too uh aliki any final thoughts yeah um i'm not sure this is terribly useful to us actually but i have to say it anyway there's something for me almost reactionary in the way that elizabeth is presented here Partly, okay, sure, to erase the the image of the great and powerful, heavily made up, enormously bejeweled monarch who who reigned supreme for so long, um, and to give us this frail teenage girl, but just this kind of sense that she's been made to a great deal more like the typical virtuous maiden of the time and spokeswoman for Protestantism than much of a person in herself, while at the same time, the play isn't really concerned with anybody else, isn't really concerned with anybody except whether they like Elizabeth or not. Hmm. Um, I I don't really know what what to do with that, but that's kind of how it sits for me. Yeah, I mean, maybe a way of framing, you know, uh, uh, the uh, production is to think about the, the court as a character. Um, and and actually, what's happened that that is as important a, a character as as the individuals within it, as it were. If we think of them as a gestalt, uh, I don't know how practical that is as a thought, but um, I think there's a lot to be mined there. I'll go to Sarah. Final thoughts? Yes, right. I feel I have to address the balance here because <laughs> this play has gone screaming into my top ten uh, favorites, which I wasn't expecting it to. Um, I really like it. And the the reason I really like it is uh, for some of the reasons that other people have talked about it being problematic. The fact that it is slightly sparse uh, and that it leaves a gap 
uh, almost in some of the, you know, I don't think that gap is intentional in the characterization. I think that's a gap that, um, sorry, I don't think it's unintentional. I, I think it's, it's deliberate. It's a gap that you then uh, fill in performance. You know, this play could be very poorly done, uh, depending on who was, who was directing it. But if you've got a director who has a, has a vision for it and, you know, has delineated all the individual characters and understands what their dynamic is and how they relate to each other and what they add to the, to the overall development of the dramatic arc. I think this could be an amazing play. And like you said earlier, Rob, you can take it off in so many different directions. Um, and you, you use the word fresh. And I think this play has the ability to be really fresh and it excites me because it's, it's one of those ones that I can totally see working on in many different ways with a modern day audience. Um, and just to address the point that Aliki mentioned, because, you know, I, I, I really take what you, what you said there, Aliki, about, you know, and what Elizabeth said as, as well, you know, yesterday about it being a little bit disappointing the way she, she's sort of, uh, you know, she becomes this sort of fragile maid. I do think, and this is, this is not related to this play, this is just to literature in general, I do think there is still this tendency to um, cast women, not just in literature and film and, and theatre and what have you, as either the indomitable, clever, sharp, uh you know that the the elizabeth are i i archetype and not just elizabeth but but sort of female characters in general they're either the feisty clever ones who are really formidable and unsinkable or they're these kind of fragile maidens who are sort of being abused and manipulated and don't really have any agency and what i really like about this is that i think there is scope in this play for her to be both because yes, she's in a terrible, terrible position. And yes, she's having all these anxiety dreams and she's dealing with massive trauma. And that is going to make her fragile and that is going to make her vulnerable. But that does not mean that she cannot also be at the same time sharp and savvy and, and you know, emotionally intelligent and aware of what is going on around her. Yeah. And I just think we could put the two together in this play. It's all there in the text. Yeah, because she does have these very strong two-hander scenes when she yeah. absolutely knows exactly what needs to be said at the right time. Um, it doesn't and, have to be either or. Yeah. Uh, and also, we've got to remember, there is a part two. So the journey continues. Um, but I'll go to Rachel next. Final thoughts? No, I agree with so much of what Sarah said. I... I mean, it, uh, how um, how you guys said that she wore a ring to say that she was married to the country, that she talks a lot in this, you know, uh, really uh, what was expected, I think, of women of the time. And she talks in the way and acts in the way that they expected. But that's not who she is on the inside. And I think... Um, she, I think there's a lot of this that she, she knows how to, how to play with it. I think her and Mary are such amazing characters in this. Um, yeah, I, 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 I really, I really loved this one. Um, I think there's a lot that you can do with it. Um, yeah, I, I, I think there, I think she's a stronger, I think she's a stronger character uh, than we might be giving her credit for. Uh, Lynn, any final thoughts? Am I, I'm not muted yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just going to basically uh, continue to echo Rachel and Sarah that, and you know, harking back to Rob and our Elizabeth's um, conversation at the at the beginning of final thoughts that yeah, keeping Elizabeth sort of on tenter hooks until the she finds out she's queen um, is an effective way of of creating dramatic attention. At, a dramatic tension where there potentially would be none. It has that effect, so that's good. Um, um, but it also, like like Sarah was saying, it really creates some really interesting potential for performance. That she's that um, all these scenes where she's the, like having the the anxiety dreams and she doesn't know if she's gonna she's just, she's gonna be executed. She never feels safe. Um, 
But then in her final scene, uh, where the Sussex hands her the crown and says, and here's my stuff that symbolize my office. I'll take the crown, but you get to keep your job. Oh, I'll take that from you, but you get to keep your job. Oh, and you, Constable, she is in charge. Mm. You get to keep your jobs because I say you get to keep your jobs. And you get to keep your jobs as long as I say you get to keep your jobs. In that scene, heart and stomach of a king right there. So it would be so great if, yeah, you know, we're worried about her, we're worried about her, you know, God, why don't she stand up for us? Oh, she, you know, uh, and then in the very last scene, it's like, whoa, yeah. And then the audience, we want them to think, you know, she kind of had that in her all along now that I think about it. That's that's what you would be be going for, that, that you know, that the character seems to be integrated once you pull it together in that in that scene. I, I think it could be super effective. Mm. Uh, Helen, any final thoughts? Yeah, what I liked about it were the um, the the courtiers and the commoners. The courtiers were very well clearly delineated. You you started with you've got Winchester, Benningfield, the constable. You've got a, a sort of determined bad guys. Then you've got others who were swaying more towards Elizabeth because she was obviously so delightful and virtuous and everything. And then you've got all the commoners. You've got Elizabeth's household which you would expect to be in favor of her, but also the soldiers, those white coats I loved, oh, and yeah. the poor people and everybody else who were totally on Elizabeth's side. I mean, I'm not saying that this is likely or even true, but nevertheless, it's very much a part of the play that there is a core of the hardliners and everybody else is gradually getting pulled towards Elizabeth. Um, and, uh, and Mary is treated with respect that you would expect because she was a queen and nobody's going to diss monarchs of England that much. I mean, King John is a, an exception to that. You would say nasty things about him everybody else is pretty well sacrosanct. So I, I think there, what's left out is very interesting. Mm, yeah. But I did love the um, the soldiers. Yeah, that soldier scene is so nicely detachable. Uh, mm. I think that's going to have a little life of its own. Um, sadly, we have to end the session there. Uh, that's all we have time for. We will be returning to the second part uh, in a little while. Uh, it is lined up. Um, there is a plan. It is a considerably longer text and I think probably a more accurate text from the will and wishes of, of Hayward. Um, uh, but uh, that we will come to uh, in a future session. All that remains is to thank all the wonderful readers for all their wonderful reading. Thank you very much, everyone, and goodbye. Bye. Remember the 17th day of November. <laughs>